Hello and welcome to this session Responding to the Masculinity as part of the online conference Responding to the Sacred, Gender and Liturgy in Conversation. I'm the Reverend Dr Jenny Holdham, I'm a curate at St John's Episcopal Church in Aberdeen in Scotland and I'm the chair for this session. This session is part of an online conference taking place over six days in April 2021 to discuss various themes and issues around gender and liturgy in the Scottish Episcopal Church and the wider Anglican Communion. In our session today, we've got two speakers. The first is going to speak and the second respond, and then this will be followed by some discussion. Our speaker today is Dr. Bill Patterson, with the respondent being Dr. Leon Van Omen. Dr. Bill Patterson's career illustrates a commitment to work with people of all ages and ability so that they might realize their unique potential. He's been practicing mindfulness and compassion for nearly 10 years, completed a four-year mindfulness training program and a two-year teacher training program with the Mindfulness Association. He's worked at the front line of mental health, teaching mindfulness-based cognitive therapy to adults and young people with anxiety and depression, including a two-year secondment for the organization responsible for community mental health services to adolescents and children in Scotland. He also teaches mindfulness to teachers, National Health Service staff, paramedics, police, students, and veterans. In 2017, Bill participated in the initiation into masculinity with Mankind Projects. This brought a renewed interest in teaching mindfulness and compassion to men and conducting research asking men about the impact of this training on their sense of masculinity. Bill played a key role in setting up a project to teach mindfulness to teachers, parents, and children in Fife and the co-creation of Mindful Nation Scotland and its launch in the Scottish Parliament in September 2019. Dr Leon van Omen is a lecturer in the School of Divinity at the University of Aberdeen. His research focuses on liturgy, ritual, narrative, suffering, reconciliation and autism. Working in the area of practical theology, he's particularly interested in the empirical and theological reality of religious practices. And much of his work is focused on pastoral needs, especially the needs of marginalised people who've been stigmatised and whose voices have not been heard. Recently, he's been working on sacramentology and sacraments on the issue of taboo and stigma in public worship, especially in intercessory prayer, and on joy in the context lush. His current research involves a project, Autism and Liturgy, reframing liturgy and theology through the lens of autism, which is funded by the Carnegie Trust. Leon is also a member of the Liturgy Commission of the Scottish Episcopal Church. We're so lucky to have these two speakers bringing wide experience of breadth of knowledge of this topic and beyond from Scotland and Europe and beyond. So now I'm going to invite Bill to speak. Thanks for the invitation to speak about both my experience of liturgy um, in relation to mindfulness and compassion training and also my research from men's perceptions of masculinity after completing that training with the Mindfulness Association. So perhaps some of the qualities that inform the Mindfulness Association's liturgy will be helpful in contemplating the liturgy of the Scottish Episcopalian Church. I'm not a spokesman for the Mindfulness Association, well not today, but I'll present here as my thoughts and understandings of my journey so far and how I make sense of kind of liturgy and mindfulness and compassion training in men. So the topic of gender and liturgy is an interesting one, and I have no experience of the liturgy of the Scottish Episcopalian Church, so I cannot comment on that at all. So I can elaborate in relation to the work that I've done and what that means to me. And liturgy to me is a way of describing a kind of structured action or a process that enables human beings to access the spiritual. And for me, that makes me turn towards kind of secular spirituality, which has been defined as the adherence to a spiritual philosophy without a religious framework. It considers oneself's relationship to the self, the other, to nature, whatever one considers ultimate. And very often that can be that sense of seeing yourself as being part of something much bigger than yourself. Secular spirituality is kind of about that relationship with yourself and outwards. So if we kind of start with that, I can talk about liturgy in relation to a kind of structured kind of um, process for actions in relation to mindfulness and compassion, it would be about developing recognition and nurturing of a thing called awareness. That ability to kind of bring our kind of senses to experience our awareness when we focus on different things, but also the, the actual awareness itself. 
and then also how phenomena appear in the mind, whether that's thinking, emotions, sensations, and recognizing how that comes in and out of our awareness, that sense of impermanence. And then the attitude of compassion, um, recognizing the suffering in the self and other with a real willingness to do something about that suffering. There's ways in which we can kind of structure ways of doing that. And then finally, there's um, structured actions about relating to interbeing. And again, that's the connection of um, shared by all sentient beings, the awareness, or that everything relies on everything else in order to manifest. So it's that sense of a real deep connection with all things. So I can understand liturgy as a way of relating to those things and spirituality. What I would say is that, or what I would argue from my experience is, what's distinctive about the liturgy of the Mindfulness Association's training? It's got a real emphasis on equality, interdependence, very limited hierarchy, a real curiosity about not knowing and trying to find ways of knowing and the co-creation of understanding. And that from there, the language is gender neutral and it's not dominated by men or women. The Mindfulness Association has many great female teachers and, um, and there's male teachers as well, but it's not particularly male or female. And when we talk about our, um, that sense of connecting to awareness or connecting to interbeing or sense of compassion, it's never gendered. You can see that in a wider context in terms of the Mindfulness Association as part of what's called the British Association of Mindfulness-Based Approaches. This is our professional body which establishes best practice for teaching mindfulness. And this is kind of reinforced right across mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, all the different kind of mindfulness-based interventions um, are part of this and it kind of sets a kind of benchmark for best practice and I would argue that part of that best practice is definitely about the things I've emphasized the liturgy of equality interdependence limited hierarchy curiosity and not knowing and the co-creation of understanding and uh, neutral gender so given my experience of liturgy um, and the men that I've interviewed I would argue that the liturgy that I've experienced from mindfulness and compassion training kind of creates a blueprint for change for men. And there might be other ones, I'm not saying it's the only one. What I mean by that, that it's, I've come across a lot of great suffering in men in terms of working with paramedics. I mean, most of us think we're the most stressed out people on the planet, but objectively measured, it's paramedics, okay? I've worked with military veterans, I've worked with the police force, um, NHS staff and social care at the front line. I've worked with people with anxiety and depression. And over the years, there's been more and more men that I've kind of worked with. In that suffering, I've kind of really seen the way in which mindfulness and compassion training with the liturgy that I've just spoke about really help men with their suffering and actually create a blueprint for change. And I think Bell Hooks is really good at acknowledging that. And she says that Men can't change if there's not a blueprint for change. Men cannot love if they are not taught the art of loving. Love is vital to maleness, to the spiritual and emotional wholeness males seek. So what I've seen from teaching mindfulness to, and compassion to men and the interviews that I've done, so it's my own experience, my teaching experience, and my kind of research experience, is that mindfulness and compassion training can empower men to live more fully through becoming more emotionally aware, more emotionally literate and emotionally available so they can learn to love themselves. And they can then truly love others and thus be truly loved by others. And then ultimately to love all sentient beings if you want to extend it that far. So that's quite a bold statement. Um, and the reason that I kind of say that is because I've experienced it in a number of different places. Um, and I wouldn't say all men have experienced that, but certainly a lot of the men that I've come across. So I just want to say a little bit about, um, and then what follows, just that kind of men's health in relation to a thing that's been bounded about called toxic masculinity. And then I want to kind of say a wee bit about my own experience of masculinity and why I started mindfulness training. And then a wee bit about liturgy. And then a wee bit about what our preliminary findings from the research we did. For me, it's kind of beyond dispute that there are certain forms of masculinity that really cause physical and mental ill health. And these create 
unhealthy social relations in the public and private sphere. So that if a man is suffering physically and, and has mental ill health, it directly impacts in the private sphere in the home and then it impacts upon the relationships outside of the home as well. And this has been kind of bounded about in lots of different places. It's been called toxic forms of masculinity. Um, and for me, I mean, one of the things is that I, I've, I've taught for 16 years in universities across Scotland, political theory and um, global political economy. So I'm really aware of different approaches to understanding our world and our institutions and things like that. And one of the things that kind of really stood out for me was that I think it's beyond doubt that the institutions that manage a great deal of our life and establish, establish the values and ways of being have historically evolved from men and from men's ideas about what's right. And this has been normalized and naturalized by these institutions. So what I mean by that is um, the institution of the family, schools, governments, international relations, and institutions within that. And I think for me, feminists gifted us with the concept of patriarchy to kind of understand in the way these institutions manage power relations. And there's a huge amount of data from explaining how many women and children have experienced aggression, violence, or emotionally closed fathers, brothers, husbands, partners, strangers. I mean, there's so much data out there on that, it's, it's quite staggering. And Bell Hooks points out that where this kind of, this kind of demands from feminists for equality and to kind of less suffer in these public and private spheres, but it's been recognized in the workplace and in, in, the, um, in, in the sexual world, but where the shared power may be in these, these kind of arenas, the place where men have refused to change, believing themselves unable to change, has been their emotional lives. So there's the argument here that, that Bell Hooks makes that many women experience men as being emotionally closed, emotionally unaware, emotionally Ill illiterate, and she states that women are, able to, are unable to really love men like that because it stands in the way of the intimacy required to develop love. And she then goes on to kind of say that men themselves are kind of really unhappy as well because they, they want to be loved. It's part of the kind of their maleness and that kind of emotional wholeness of being male. So that kind of definition of wanting to be loved and the kind of ill health that goes with that has been picked up in the a number of places in the literature. So Lomas, um, in his study of men, talked about toxic masculinity is identifying attitudes and practice that impact negatively on the physical and mental health. And they argued that it was things like being unemotional, independent and separate, non-nourishing behaviours, being aggressive and dispassionate to others, a denial of weakness, a denial of vulnerability, taking health risk behavior and a reluctance to seek help. So this was kind of quite a good definition of the way in which um, toxic masculinity, trying to live a form of masculinity creates these kind of things. And we only have to kind of look at things like the way in which these qualities kind of create anxiety, depression and stress and poor health outcomes for men. Um, so for example, having lots of stress creates abnormal patterns in the brain, within the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and the amygdala, so that it kind of limits our ability to engage with others. Um, and that kind of is really bad for our heart in terms of high blood pressure, being anxious all the time. You could argue from there, you only need to look at like, for example, the kind of male suicide rates in Scotland or the life expectancy of a man in Scotland or the male violence against women and children or male violence on men that this is significant in Scotland. And this Scotland I've primarily focused on, I've kind of looked at this. So this kind of toxic masculinity really impacts upon the way that men engage with other men, engages with the way that um, men engage with women and children as well. So I found that really interesting and, and, and frightening and it made me that sense of wanting to do something about it. And the reason for that is because my own experience is coming from a a kind of housing state in Fife, which was incredibly violent. Um, and growing up in Abbey View was, was a very particular form of masculinity that was dominant. And for me, violence was the answer inside the house and outside the house. And it was always administered by men. 
And this was kind of naturalized, normalized at school. Boys will be boys. And then even when I left school and I went to work in Her Majesty's Dockyard at Recythe, it was male dominated. There was male aggression. Disputes were set, settled by aggression. Women were seen as nurturers or sexual objects. And that continued when I went into hairdressing. There was a male hierarchy. There was a lot of sexual harassment, which was normalized, naturalized, i.e. men would touch or hold women without permission, without asking. It was all kind of normalized, you know, wasn't seen as anything wrong with that. And even when I went and worked, um, joined the Royal Marines, and I was in the Marines, was that, again, men, there's a really specific form of masculinity, and women, again, were sexual objects or carers. Certainly weren't in the same way as equals. And then even after I left that and went to university, and I was studying um, there, there was still attitudes of kind of that kind of form of masculinity around. Even though I studied kind of feminist thought, and I was suddenly confronted with this idea about unequal power relations amongst men and women, it wasn't really until I kind of started practicing mindfulness that I kind of realized what they were on about. At the age of 32, I'd kind of done all this, and none of these places had taught me anything about being emotionally aware, emotionally literate, emotionally vulnerable, and how to self-manage my emotional states. Now, I'm not alone. I mean, now it's like we could look, go out into the street, you'd meet so many men that couldn't talk about their emotional, um, what, even how they were feeling today, other than they're all right, everything's all right. So I think it was only kind of reflecting on that when I was studying and I was teaching this as well. And I kind of got this whole idea about uh, my identity being socially constructed. And it was, a, it was a big part of my whole life story about all the places I've just spoke about, created this idea of who Bill was and what Bill did in these situations. And when I was in academia, I kind of became a really anxious, quite angry because of the way short-term contracts evolved, the way that full-time jobs never arrived that the kind of, you're nodding Jenny because you know what it's like. I mean, we've all been through this and it's kind of, you end up, and I had two small children who were, by the time I left, they were three and six and they had broken sleep for six years. So I hadn't slept properly either. So a real sense of insecurity and a real sense of being let down by studying so hard for a PhD and then not being able to do anything with it and a family support. So I was really anxious and angry. And somebody said to me, have you thought about trying some mindfulness? I think the mindfulness kind of really helped me to kind of see that I could pause and stop with this thing called awareness and see the transient nature of the things that came through my awareness. Like my thinking, they're just emotion, they're just electrical impulses of, of ideas of the past and present, which are then kind of, they, they move if we don't fixate on them. And similarly with my emotional states, the kind of anger and anxiety would move if I didn't fixate on it. And same with joy, love, compassion, interest, excitement, all these things are kind of quite transient. So the idea is to kind of recognize thoughts are not facts, to recognize that these things are all transient and to see that you're much bigger and much more than just your emotional states or your thoughts or your emotions. In that sense, you're a being with awareness where these things can come and go. And from this, you're invited to really bring kindness, to really recognize kindness as a felt sense and bring it to yourself and what you experience. So rather than self-criticism, self-loathing, um, and kind of giving yourself a hard time and being quite resentful of others, is the ability to kind of bring kindness to yourself. And that was revolutionary for me, to actually meet myself with kindness. Developing that kindness for myself and then kindness for others and noticing that, that creates much more space in the way that, I get caught up in my kind of thinking, emotion, sensations, contracts me, and that limits my potential, limits who I can be, and limits access to me. I'm not emotionally available. But the more I practice kindness and compassion, the more I can open up and be connected to myself, to others, to all sentient beings. So this idea of self-management is really key to the literature on mindfulness. So the liturgy in this is really interesting because the way that the mindfulness is taught is in a way that encourages people to kind of, for example, it's not didactic lectures. We sit in a circle and then somebody might lead that meditation and it could be, if it's not teaching, it can be anybody in the group. If it is teaching, it could be male or female or other. I mean, that's the thing is I was recently working online with a, a colleague and on Zoom and she had her name, Christine, and then beside it, she had references she and her. 
and I had Bill, he and him, which then opens the door for other people to be non-binary, that they can describe themselves and their sexuality or the way that they perceive their gender in any way they want. So this idea of being quite open to that in terms of power relations, we're in a circle, which means equality and kind of wholeness. And then we kind of explore the mindfulness together, maybe um, practice a meditation. And then there's this idea of inviting each other to talk about what we experienced. So it's talking about what did you experience in that practice is an open question. There's no right or wrong way to feel, but there's a curiosity to kind of explore your own experience. The mindfulness teacher brings silence, stillness and spaciousness, and we agree to work in that environment. And in that environment, we then kind of have permission to speak about what we've noticed in that, in that practice and to kind of respect each other and what we've, we've kind of experienced, to meet it with kindness, without judgment. So there's a kind of freedom to explore your authentic self, free from censorship. And it's often argued that in that process, there's a kind of way of meeting each other, which kind of creates a sense of community, which is much more egalitarian and democratic. It's egalitarian in terms of we all recognize the worth of each other and the worth of each other's experience. As each other talks about their experience, it resonates around the group with everybody else. Did I experience that? Was that my experience? That's interesting they experience that. What does that feel like? So we're kind of learning from each other as that goes around, including the teacher. I mean, I learn every time I teach. And I think it's that recognizing that everybody's in the same boat. We all suffer and we wish you didn't. Um, and the way we act unskillfully. I mean, it's a great thing about compassion, training and compassion is you learn that you've learned unskillful ways of managing your own health and well-being. You've unhealthy ways of maybe managing your mind, your emotions and sensations, just like everybody else. And just like everybody else, they want to be happy, they want to be loved, they want to be heard, want to be respected, just like me. But they go about it unskillfully. So it creates that real empathy. So I had felt that and then I did the Mankind Projects training into masculinity, which is initiation into masculinity. And it's phenomenal to sit with 40 men in a group, in a circle, and hear 40 men check in and say, this is how I feel right now. I feel terrible. My brother committed suicide. I feel great because this has happened. I feel, um, I feel terrified of sitting in a group of men because I'm gay. And you guys have always been frightened of, but it's really healthy for me to sit here or hearing men talk about the kind of the shame. I've been, you know, I was at, the thing I was at was a guy saying, I've been looking at other women. I'm here with my wife and family and I've been looking at other women. I feel really guilty. And so it's a, a great level of hearing men speak like that rather than that kind of masculinity where we don't share. So I did their Warrior Weekend, which is initiation in masculinity. There was 160 other men there. And I really got to see men as brothers and kind of fellow sufferers with so much potential, not competitors, critics or opponents. So I took this and had a massive impact to me. And then I took it to my friend, Kirsty Alexander at Strathclyde University. And we discussed this as a way of what would it be like to ask other men if they had this experience? So we interviewed 10 men over three months. We asked them to take part in two interviews. And there was, we've got about 30 hours of interviews now to go through. There were semi-structured interviews, asking them to talk about that. And many of the men, most of the men kind of talked about the kind of way in which they had experienced difficulties and other unhealthy ways of being, aggression, isolation, emotionally closed, the use of drugs and alcohol to escape all this, those kind of things, and how they had learned about how to be open, emotionally open, emotionally literate, how they'd learned to kind of um, articulate the way that they're thinking and feeling and to trust other people, to be vulnerable and have open communication and honest communication, not be frightened of it. I think what's really, what's really clear from the, the interviews we did was that many of the men have had, a, have had a significant impact upon their lives in terms of doing this training and shifted them from a form of masculinity which is very close to one that's much more open. So it's masculinities, there's different forms of masculinity, there's not one masculinity. And it's enabling men to find that so that they can be happier in themselves, love themselves, which enables them to love others, which in turn opens them to be loved by others. So I think moving towards that kind of training for me, that kind of liturgy, is a way of kind of creating a, the potential for men to kind of see each other as, um, as friends, as carers, as somebody that nourishes them, respects them, cares for them, and without judgment. 
and those are the kind of things I've been working on with men in different um, weekends and different retreats. So to bring all that together, what I would say is the liturgy from the Mindfulness Association that I've learned is based on equality, interdependence, limited hierarchy, curiosity and not known, and the co-creation of understanding where the language is gender neutral. And for me, that's created a blueprint for change. And I hope maybe some of that's helpful um, in our discussion today. Thanks very much. First of all, I would like to, to, to thank the organizers of this conference uh, for this opportunity to be involved, to uh, give me the, the responsibility, the, the, the opportunity, I mean. Um, maybe it's a responsibility as well to uh, respond to Bill's uh, talk. First, first, I want to start with a kind of a disclaimer, and that is that I'm not an expert in gender studies. Um, I, my expertise is maybe in liturgy, but not in gender studies necessarily, although as Jenny um, kindly said in her introduction, uh, my, my focus in my research is very often on marginalized people or what, what my interest in liturgy very often is uh, in many of my research projects is on the way liturgy can exclude people, uh, be that because of mental health issues, be that because of age, uh, disabilities, autism, or indeed gender. Bill, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm grateful that you sent it beforehand because there's so much to take in. If I just had to respond just like this, then it would be difficult. So um, I will refer a couple of times to your written uh, paper maybe, um, but it's, it's, it's really, really helpful. I think in your talk, you point to various issues related to gender in, and that idea of toxic masculinity is, is really powerful, I think, to think through. And certainly in this conference, when we talk about gender and liturgy, very often I think uh, we think about, oh, women are excluded, and, which is true, and, and we need to do something about it. But I'm really grateful that this conference also includes this, this talk and, and, and a response um, about masculinity, because as you say, there are some issues to think about. So thanks for that. Now, my task is to respond to you and to, to relate what you say about mindfulness to liturgy. Now, that's not a straightforward task I've discovered <laughs> because it's, it's not necessarily the same thing. Now, what I'm not going to do is point to the similarities and the dissimilarities. That would be fascinating to do. And there is a lot to say about it, but I, I don't think that is really the task for today. But what I try to do is, is to, to glean some, some uh, gold nuggets from your talk and, and see what we can do with that uh, when, when I think through those issues liturgically. So that's what I'm trying to do in my response. So one of the things that, that I think uh, that, that you do, Bill, in, this, in, in your talk is that you, you point to the socially constructed in deeply destructive patterns of masculinity and that that lead to unhealthy behavior inside the house, outside the house, private, public. And I think that is one of the things that simply needs to, uh, to be forefronted in, in what we are talking about. There are forms of masculinity that are unhealthy and even toxic and have a lot of uh, repercussions in our relationships. And, and that is so important to think about. And I think underlying what you're saying is this a question, what does it mean to be a man, right? And when I think about liturgy, I think a very similar question is at work in the liturgy as well. So the way I understand liturgy is as, as the meeting between God and people. The, the liturgy tells the story of God. And good liturgy, in my view, creates store and also space for the stories of the people. And they are somehow connected. That's what liturgy is about, the connection between the story of God and the stories of people. Now, when we, when we think through our stories, when we tell our stories, we are asking in the liturgy, in that context, the question, what does it mean to be human? What does, it, what does my story mean? And so what does it mean to be me, in a sense? And for me, that means, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean indeed to be maybe transgender, agender, or whatnot? And so I think that there is, there is a first point of, of contact, I think, between what you were saying about mindfulness and, and what you've pointed to and, and the way I understand liturgy. Uh, the second thing that, that you refer to a lot, especially in your uh, written talk, maybe less so in, in what you just said, but certainly in your, your writing, is, is that theme of love. 
and that love is, is so central to mindfulness, the self-love, the self-acceptance, uh, self-compassion, um, so central to uh, deconstruct those toxic patterns that you talked about and, and look at ourselves as men um, with compassion, acceptance instead of self-criticism or feeling the criticism of others, competition, all of that. It's interesting that when we look at the Scottish liturgy in particular, this is not true for all liturgies, but uh, I mean, in a sense it is, but, but it, it's, it's really prominent in the Scottish liturgy that we use in this blue book, 1982. Love is writ large in that liturgy. It is, the, the opening is all about love. So it starts um, right at the beginning with the call it for purity. There is love. And then if you just follow that liturgy, um, a summary of the law, our Lord Jesus Christ said the first commandment is this, love your God. And the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. So we have the love of God, the love of ourself, and the love of our neighbor right at the beginning of the liturgy. And then, and this is specific to the Scots liturgy, I think, the way it opens that rite of confession is God is love and we are his children or God's children. There is no room for fear in love. We love because God loved us first. So love is all over there. And then we have a confession. And it's interesting that love is not mentioned in the confession. Although uh, if you go to, I think the Church of England does have uh, one that we didn't love our neighbor as we should or something like that. Anyways, um, but then the absolution, God is both power and love. And God forgive us, free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by spirit or God's spirit. And raise to new life, a blueprint for change race to new life in Christ our Lord. And so love is there from the very beginning. And, and it just strikes me that the, you give that a very central place in mindfulness, Bill. And, and when I was thinking about this, I was like, well, this is what I hear every Sunday, basically. And that's not to say, well, we are better or whatever. That's, that's absolutely not the point. I'm, I'm trying to, to find points of connection. And I think here is a huge one. Um, so that might help us to think through how what you have, given us in your talk how we can appropriate that somehow uh, in, in liturgy and the revision of liturgy. Just, just one caveat that I want to point to, uh, one pitfall that we, we should not run into, and this comes especially from my work uh, on autism, and that is um, you also stressed emotion as something very important, emotionally literate, and men are not emotionally literate as a sweeping statement. And of course, that's a generalization. We both know that. Now, love has to do with emotion, but love, we shouldn't, we should be careful of equating love with emotion and certainly love with feeling. And I know you're not doing that, but I just want to emphasize that because especially some people with autism, and again, we shouldn't generalize here, but some people with autism and some other people struggle big time with their emotions and, and knowing what their emotions are. But there are very many ways of expressing our love that that is not necessarily related to feeling and uh, i'm not saying that you say that bill i just wanted to to point that here and point to that fact that um we shouldn't with saying good things about emotions we shouldn't exclude then other people again of course uh later in your talk you 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 talked about the research you did with with the men uh 10 men you interviewed them um and then you mentioned some some of your findings. And I just wanted to, to comment on a couple of findings that you presented uh, in the written paper and some of you you mentioned here as well in your talk today. It seems to me that if mindfulness helps men to become more themselves, right? I mean, that, that's, that's the project that you're doing basically with mindfulness, if I understand you correctly. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's almost like peeling away layers of anger, of aggression, of violence, of, of all those toxic and, and destructive patterns that, that we've constructed, that we've grown up with uh, and, and that we take for real. And it's, it's peeling away that. And just a question for us all to, to think about, how, how might liturgy do the same kind of peeling away of what we think is true about ourselves, true about the others? How can we do that? It's, it's a question. Uh, and maybe here I'm thinking about words that, that are central to the liturgy and to theology. It, I'm thinking about God's love again, about grace, about acceptance, about forgiveness maybe. Uh, words that, 
I think resonate with mindfulness uh, if, as I understand it. Um, so that's one, one way of thinking about those results. Now, a very interesting finding was that some men said, well, mindfulness has not so much to do, to do with being either a man or a woman. And I thought that's interesting in, in the context of, of, of today's talk, that, that's a really interesting one. A focus on differences, difference reinforces and reifies separation and division you write. Now I've got two thoughts on this. First, a discussion about gender in relation to liturgy or, or more widely can result in a feeling that one has to be politically correct. And it can create a kind of an antagonism between men or women. That's at least the feeling that I sometimes have in these discussions. You can't say everything that you think. And, and I think that is just utterly unhelpful. If we have this discussion about gender and liturgy, and in my understanding, that's what the, con the conference is really meant to have that honest uh, discussion. And so um, just going off on that finding that that some of the men in your research said, well, it's not has nothing to do with being a man or a woman, just, just brought that to mind that in order to have that honest discussion, we should be open to talk, to listen to each other um, and, and not have that kind of antagonism. But much more importantly, the second thing that I wanted to say about that is that quote of, of uh, difference reinforces and reifies um, separation and division. That is, that is so sad if it does. And I'm just thinking in the context of this, of, of gender and diversity about God creating man and woman, women to reflect God's image. And so there is something about diversity there. I'm not talking about binary issues that is, and I'm not going into Genesis one and two and, and all of that, but there's something about diversity that displays a kind of a richness that is necessary in order to understand who God is and in order to, to reflect that image of God, if that makes sense. So there's a richness in diversity. And then you go on to say that there wasn't, I'm, I'm citing you, Bill, there wasn't acknowledgement that the body has been disciplined to only feel what social norms have dictated. Thus, gendering the body can be a block to being open to what is going on as it is going on without judgment or preference. And I thought that was so powerful. We have been socially conditioned to feel certain things and feel certain things not, and not to feel certain things. And, whoa, that is something. How is that? And, and that's something just to pause, I think, really. It makes me pause and think that about that. And, and it strikes me that the Christian communities of all should be a place of acceptance where that social block is not necessary because we are accepted. And so we are allowed to feel this or that. And we should not be restrained and restricted by social expectations. And, and time and again, and I think this is important when we talk about masculinity and toxic forms of that time and again in scripture we see that god calls people to be conformed to the patterns of god whether that is laid down in torah whether that is revealed in jesus christ and not to conform to the patterns of this world romans 12 verse 1 to 3 of course is is, is, is a, a key text here god invites us and our bodies to be disciplined by god's norms instead of social norms and, and that would be my kind of theological response to that powerful quote that you had there about the social block, the social norms that dictate what we can feel or not feel. All right, my final point, the, the driving force in your project, Bill, seems to be uh, that blueprint for change. If, if we want to do something about toxic masculinity, we, we need a blueprint for change. And, and, and you didn't find that unless, until you met <laughs> met with mindfulness or discovered mindfulness and there's nothing that I can disagree with with what you say and at the same time I will confess that it makes me sad if liturgy cannot be that blueprint for change in the liturgy as a core practice of the Christian community there is we are telling that story of God and we 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 are told that we are loved by God and that we are accepted despite our sin. And we, 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 all of that, 
If that's not a blueprint for change, I don't know what is. Well, mindfulness, you just gave the answer. But do you see what I mean? It is sad if this cannot be that. And therefore, and so that is not to set up a competition with mindfulness, not at all. It's rather you make me think that if the liturgy fails to be that blueprint for change, then, then we are in need of liturgical revision, that's for sure. But I think actually it can be. Um, there, there's this, uh, I'm just thinking about one thing, uh, the, the, the strong link between liturgy and ethics that has been highlighted by many liturgical scholars. Liturgy invites us into that story. That's what, what, what I begin with uh, in my response. Liturgy invites us to that story. And in the light of that story of God, we see the stories of ourselves and they're connected. If we are invited by God not to conform to the patterns of this world, but the patterns of God, then that involves change. That's why we begin in the liturgy, I think, with the confession. And, and maybe here's the difference with, with uh, mindfulness, that in the liturgy, that confession is, is forefronted, right? Because despite self-acceptance, and, and there can be, we also need to talk about, well, sometimes, sometimes things are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and there's judgment, that, that difficult word judgment that we don't like, but there is judgment. And we confess, I think there is something beautiful in that, uh, painful and beautiful. We confess that not everything has gone right. And we have not loved as we should. We have not loved ourselves as we should, not, not others, not God. And therefore we confess that. But then, as I said in the beginning and quoted from the liturgy, God is both power and love and the love is returned immediately and we are being loved and so that must be somehow a blueprint for change i think we, we change we we confess at the very beginning of the liturgy that we are in need for change and so that's not to take away anything from the power of mindfulness um but it is to advocate that liturgy should somehow have a similar function and if it's not, then maybe it's not necessarily, and I'm, I will conclude with that thought, maybe it's not that we need to revise the text of the liturgy and the words of the liturgy because it's all there. And I hope my response made that clear a little bit, that it's all there, I think. But it is possible to go to church your whole life, sit through the liturgy or more positively participate in the liturgy and not be changed. So when we think about liturgical revision, when it comes to masculinity or gender in general, certainly there is work to do in terms of the text when it comes to, to women issues, and I'm not denying anything of that. But maybe we should look at our liturgical practices and how we are a liturgical worshipping faith community instead of just the text. And how are we that community in which the social norms are dictated by the love of God rather than social constructs that can be destructive. And with that, I will. And thank you very much, uh, Bill, for that talk. It was um, a very rich experience to, to respond to that. Thanks a lot. Jenny, over to you again. Thank you so much, Bill and Laum, for those contributions, their thoughtfulness, their honesty, and their openness, and taking us from mindfulness, which some people may be familiar with, others people might not, but also thinking about toxic masculinity, people's own experience, that wider experience. And Leon, in reminding us, thank you, particularly for me as someone who says those words, sometimes often, sometimes not, depending on the circumstances, in reminding that liturgy is far more than the words we say and what we do. So I'm gonna, we've got, if we were in a normal room, we'd have time for questions, but what's going to happen now is I'm going to give Bill an opportunity to respond to Leon's response and we'll see what goes from there. So, Bill, do you have anything automatically you'd like to respond to or question or add from what you've just heard? Thanks very much for the response, Leon. Um, very interesting and uh, insightful. I think the you, you re referenced there a couple of times to, to God embodying these qualities of love and that relationship between God and the people, that sense of father. I think that's what's been problematic is this idea of father for a lot of men in terms of the way that fathers have disciplined and fathers have been judgmental and fathers have kind of um, related um, to men, women and children. And that, 
I mean, when I went to the Mankind Project with 160 men, a lot of the guys had real trouble because of their relationship with their father. It all came down to the relationship with the father never been good enough, um, which created that sense of criticism, self-criticism, and that criticism was always there. So th I think the idea of father, just the word itself conjures up so many things for so many people, which is difficult. Um, so I, I thought that was quite interesting and something that could be explored in lots of ways. Um, but the other thing that I just wanted to reflect on there was the idea about the body being disciplined was that that, that was a, a kind of um, the Mindfulness Association's conference last year where we did a section on masculinity and femininity and we took the men to one side and there was like, I think there was like four or 500 people at the conference. Um, we went, all the men went to one side and we did a session and kind of spoke about what it was like to be a man and things we, we kind of noticed. And the women did the same thing and then we came together as a group and then spoke to each other about what we'd noticed and stuff. Then one of the things that came out of that as well was that idea of, really we're beings with awareness, which happen to be in a kind of these bodies, right? And that awareness is that connection to what some people would call spirituality. It's much bigger than ourselves and we can see it connecting to others. But the way that we can experience that sense of um, the phenomenon that comes through the mind and comes through our awareness is disciplined by the way we've been told our bodies should experience things. Like, because I'm a man, I should experience I should be courageous, I should be brave and strong and all that sort of thing. And my body shouldn't be experiencing vulnerability and, and, and emotions and things like that. And women talked about the same way as their body was seen as kind of as a sexual object. And that was a way of creating affirmation and all these kind of things. So it was interesting to come to the two points, which was one, the more we talk about men and women and other uh, people who don't accept binary, is that it gets in the way of actually just being present with awareness. And then the other point was, well, if we're looking at the barriers to just being with awareness for ourselves and other beings, it's looking at what are the barriers to me being compassionate to you is that maybe I've been a man that's been brought up to think these kind of things about other men, do you see what I mean? And the way that my body should behave around other, other people. So when we're looking at the barriers to kind of being present with the self and other and to create that sense of interbeing. So the way that the body's been disciplined by lots of institutions um, is, is I think particularly important because for men that I've worked with, it's that kind of discipline from institutions that gets in the way of connecting to other human beings and all sentient beings, really. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that, that is very interesting, actually. Um, it's, yeah, I, I don't have much to say on, the, again, uh, that, that social construct uh, of, of male, female, uh, masculinity, femininity. I mean, that's, that's just so important. And I... I'm not sure whether the liturgy in itself can fully respond to that, because what I've tried to point to in that regard is that I think that in the liturgy, there is a lot that talks about acceptance, because to me, it feels like underlying all of that is, is acceptance, right? Self-acceptance, but also acceptance from or by another. And, and that's what I would like to point to theologically, that acceptance comes from God ultimately. And, and I think that that can help uh, a big time. I don't think that the liturgy goes into that much detail to kind of deconstruct all those social things and reconstruct that theologically and all, all of that. And, and therefore, I mean, that's another reason why we need to think about liturgical practices, which are much wider than just, just what we do on a Sunday morning, so to speak. So that's, that's, that's the only thing that I can say in response to that. Sh shall I respond to your, your um, point about the fatherhood of God as well? Or, or did you want to... No, no, no. Yeah, um, I've deliberately avoided um, calling God a father and whenever I cited from the blue book um, I uh, made a mistake of saying uh, we are his children I immediately corrected myself we are God's children because I'm very much aware um, that at least for for women that can be very problematic and, and I think it's very helpful Bill that you point out well for men it can be very problematic as well what do you do with that is the next question and I think uh, there are others in this conference that can speak much better to that and, and have more experience and read more widely and thought more deeply about that. The one thing that I think we should be careful of is, is uh, doing away with all concepts of fatherhood of God or motherhood of God, for that matter. Mm -hmm. I think we need both rather than doing away with it. But then when we call God a father, I think we need to go back to, well, to scripture uh, to theology, tradition, and, and, and ask ourselves the question, what does that mean? 
when we say father. And so for you, that means something else than for me, for example. Um, if you had a good relationship with your father and he was lovely and all the rest of it, that, that brings a very different connotation. And therefore your liturgy starts completely different because um, it does start. I mean, the very first line, Jenny, you know this, because you say it every Sunday, grace, peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe we need to change that. But at the same time, maybe it's better to say from God, father and mother or our parents or our caregiver, I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I hesitate to get rid of that fatherhood because if you look at uh, what fatherhood means in, in the Hebrew Bible, there's a completely different concept than most of us have in Scotland in 2021. And so and it's beyond my expertise to, to go into detail, but I know it's very different and it has different connotations there. So, so I've avoided using father, but I did emphasize the relationship that that's right. Uh, but not in terms of father, uh, but that relationship is there in, in, in many ways, in many yeah, ways. I think there's a similarity. I mean, Bell Hooks talks about you know, radical feminists talking about all men are useless and all men are not useless. And it's that idea of you can't do away with the word man or masculinities. There are different ways of being a man. There's different forms of masculinity. So it's kind of being quite um, clear about what you mean by these things and embodying it. Um, I think that's a kind of key thing as well. I would really enjoy listening to Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you've, you, you're obviously maybe aware of Joseph Campbell, the great um, social anthropologist who um, been writing since the 1950s, and he gave like many lectures in the kind of 70s and 80s, um, and he kind of talked about the distinction between a kind of kind of these meditative practices and kind of um, in, in, in the church and, and why they're so different. And one of the things that he kind of, he drew, drew on was the way that this idea of the kind of love, acceptance, and kind of um, affirmation of just being is externalized in the church. It's out there, whereas these more meditative practices are more in here. So the, to, the God's not outside, God's in here. That idea of spirituality is here. So that sense of getting to know yourself by exploring your awareness and the kind of things that come into your awareness gives you an idea of the kind of transient nature of your thoughts, emotions, and sensations, but also that kind of what I then am is a being with awareness and that being awareness is much more attuned to kindness and gentleness and warmth. And that's already all in me and it's connected to others. It's not an external thing that I have, I have to add. It's all here, all just kind of waiting to be opened. And he kind of talks about that as being two different ways of connecting to the spiritual. Um, and, I, and I kind of thought he did that in a, and a way to me that made sense of the distinction between the two forms of spirituality. I was, it was just struck thinking of both what you two said that it, you quoted from one of the liturgies that we have in the Scottish Episcopal Church, which is the Eucharist, the communion on a Sunday or Wednesday, but actually probably is the main way that people engage with the church, with liturgy led by the church, but equally struck by the breadth and the tradition we have, which allows that more time for silence. So the more meditative prayer, thinking of the daily prayer practices, of thinking of the traditions of reflectiveness of silent retreat. And maybe is it a case that we always, you, you, you went to the blue book for the Eucharist liturgy to go, okay, how do we talk about liturgy? And is it a, a challenge to all of us to think wider about liturgy, to maybe reclaim some of these practices um, in the way that, particularly in the States, there's been people from other traditions who are rediscovering the contemplative tradition. And I think that's been, a, that's a challenge for me to kind of go, one, where are, which liturgies are we talking about when we're looking at all of them and all of them are ways to engage with our story and God's story. But also actually, are there ways we can incorporate our liturgical practices? So is it a challenge to all of us to recognize that sometimes words are problematic? You've both talked about God as father, but silence has always been part of the Christian tradition. So are there times where words are inadequate, and maybe dangerous and something else will do? Yeah, I think that kind of thing of contemplative practice. So there's a big distinction when we, we do mindfulness training between meditating and mindfulness. Meditating for a lot of people is kind of focusing on like a, an object, say it could be any symbol or kind of um, a sound or something like that. And that's the focus. When you focus on that, 
and then try and keep everything else out. Where mindfulness is really about kind of recognizing what comes into the silence and the stillness and the spaciousness and trying to see it as being transient, that it's not fixed and not fixating on it so that your identity becomes quite fluid because a lot of the ideas about who I think I am are actually quite transient. So the, the kind of more you practice mindfulness, more you can see a lot of the ideas that you have are quite transient. They're just thoughts moving through awareness. And the idea is that I suppose when I've spoken to other people who've done contemplative practices, it's been about just sitting in silence, but not working with what arises. I don't know if that's what you guys do. Working with what arises and they're kind of coming back to, I'm only human, it's okay to recognize that, but I don't have to act on it. So that, there's a felt sense of the kind of um, compassion for the self. It's okay, I'm only human. I can allow these things to come and go without fixating and acting on them. But also it's okay to have these thoughts. There's nothing wrong with me for having these thoughts. I'm only human and I've been socially conditioned to have these. So allow that to kind of come and go and to, to kind of um, not seek affirmation or outside of yourself. It's being able to kind of do that for yourself and then sharing that with the group which really helps everybody kind of recognize we're only human and we're doing our best to get through this, but can we do it with kindness rather than criticism and kind of condemnation and having kind of compassionate responsibility in terms of, I recognize that I should be doing this because what I am doing isn't working. Yeah. The way I'm doing that's judgment. And what I'm doing is unskillful and it's causing me suffering and it's causing other people suffering. So can I change that so it creates less suffering? And then making commitments to yourself about acting in the world more skillfully so that there's less suffering for yourself and others. Um, and that kind of comes back to the self, but also sharing with the group. So that was a distinction between kind of contemplative practice and mindfulness. Is we can just, so for example, when I was in Granada and they, they talked about the, the kind of um, the Alhambra, and it was an amazing place. And the, all the kind of um, kings and sultans and that there meditated all day and then went out and slaughtered each other. <laughs> and I was like, so what were they doing during the meditation? <laughs> you know, what? I mean, I, my meditation, I'm trying to bring kindness to what I notice and all that kind of stuff. And So what is it people are doing in their meditation if they're fixating on things about the other? Uh, once I finish this, I'm going to kill the, the heathens or I'm going to kill the... Do you know what I mean? that? So what is it we do in that contemplative practice, which is a benefit to the self and other, which is beyond gender, I think? It makes me think of Ignatian spirituality as one of the spiritualities where you, where you look inside and, and find God inside in a, in a way, because God is in us. Much more to say there, and, and you can go wrong theologically easily. But I, I, it just makes me think about that. So, so I think Jenny, you're you're right. We we have a lot of resources in our tradition, um, and and maybe we need to dust off some of them. Um, I just wonder, Bill, whether with mindfulness, if if with all that non-judgmental, um, I mean, not it's non-judgmental. Um, it's it's being kind. But where do you get your, your kind of moral framework from? So what I see, and I, I think a difference with liturgy is that that, that silence is um, filled with God's story, as it were. And I, I, I ask, they, I mean, Christianity is not about morality. I, I don't think religion is about morality. It's, it, religion is much more, and therefore I, I rather use God's story rather than God's law or whatever, um, because it, a lot is about doing, but it's it, it's grounded in love, and, and that's something else than a morality or a moral framework, although that follows from that probably. So so that silence, in, in a way, it's filled with a particular story, which makes me aware that when I go out of my palace, not as if I'm king, but I shouldn't slaughter my enemy, right? So, so I get my kind of morals from somewhere, from that story of being loved and know that the other is loved equally by God, regardless of the gender, of course. Um, so maybe it's not helpful to, to go into too much detail between the difference between liturgy and, and mindfulness, but I'm just trying, as I, as I think that's my task today, to, to kind of liturgically think through what you say about mindfulness and masculinity. And I think there is something that I quite like about liturgy and it, it gives us uh, a particular story. Uh, and of course, that, that story has been uh, mistold throughout the generations and it has been abused by, by generations and throughout the generations. But 
that's that's the same as the fatherhood of God. Well, let's go back to what it actually means and what it can be. Um, and it can be life-giving. It can make, make us flourish. It, it can be so much more than that we often think, um, if that makes sense. Mm. And Jenny, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, yes, I, I focused on the blue book. I, I, I will confess that's my kind of... My place to go to uh, but of course we have daily prayer and beyond daily prayer we have the liturgical year and and how we structure our year which is also already different from the calendar year so talking about social norms and constructs there we have a, a quite different construct which is the traditional construct and of course we need to be critical of that as well but you are absolutely right that there is much in our tradition that we can use and and there's a lot of wisdom i think in the tradition yeah. And I've really enjoyed listening and thinking and I've got questions, but obviously this is a part of a series of talks that's leading up to a plenary. And I just wanted to ask each of you two before we finish, if there's like just one sentence or a question or two that you're going to be carrying on thinking about these things as we, we walk forward throughout the rest of our day and into the rest of the year either a takeaway or a question that you're kind of like, oh, I need to think about this a bit more. For me, I, I've had a real uh, resistance to anything with God in it for so long. And it, then it suddenly became aware that when I used, I read um, 40 Rules of Love. I don't know if you've read that book. It's a beautiful book. And it's all about Rumi, the poet, who um, meets um, a, a kind of a mystic who's all about love. And informs his poetry. It's a beautiful book. And um, I kind of realized that when people are talking about love a uh, God in that way, it's the same. Um, they, they mean, to me, I'm talking about awareness and kind of interbeing and all that. And that we're talking about the same thing and using different words. And that's been a, a kind of recent thing for me over the last few years. So the way that um, Leon's replied to what I've said as well has given me thought to there's a, a more connection to that as well, a deeper connection to that. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that I, I'm going to the Blue Book, sorry, Jenny. But one of the things that I like about the absolution in the Blue Book is that it has that heal and strengthen us by a spirit and raise us to new life. So, so the driving force in Bill's project, I think, is that blueprint for change. And it just strikes me that that sentence raises to new life in Christ our Lord uh, might be a liturgical phrasing of that same drive. And... So that's what I want to highlight. And then as a question, then for, for us all to think about is, in what ways do you think that liturgy can actually help us with, with deconstructing those toxic patterns of masculinity or femininity or, or whatever it is? Um, deconstruct that, deconstruct in St. Paul's language, the patterns of this world. And in what ways can it help us then and shape us to conform to the pattern of God, or in other words, to, to be fully part of that story of God. That, that would be my question. Thank you both again so much for your time and your contributions. It's given me, and I hope it will uh, give the people who watch this so much to think about. Thank you again. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.